Hi, so if you have tried painting before, you know how hard it can be to get the shape and perspective in your image right. So you probably know of the technique of using some guidelines on your canvas to help you locate the objects. What you can do then if you're painting from real life is that you use a transparent sheet you can look through to see which parts of the image need to go in which squares. Now if you would only use one color per square, you really don't need any artistic talent to get a approximation of the image. And ray tracing uses the exact same idea as the painter of looking through a grid and tracing the rays through the scenes as they bounce from object to object. And this is what I want to talk about in this video and explain the concept of ray tracing and do some little bit of ray tracing using pen and paper. So here is what we need to do. First, we set up the scene. We put some objects here, we put the camera at the origin and we put the viewport in the middle. So now for each pixel on the canvas, we need to find the corresponding square on the viewport to look through. We need to find the, or we need to calculate the corresponding vector from the camera through this viewport square into the scene. And then we need to determine if the ray hits anything in the scene. And if it hits an object, we return the color of this closest object. As you can see, the position of the viewport determines the field of view of the camera. So let's say we choose this square on the viewport to look through, which corresponds to the pixel in the second row in the fifth column on the canvas. Let's say the position of this square in the 3D scene is V and the position of the camera is O, so the ray vector simply is V minus O. A sphere is defined by its center and the radius. All the points that have this distance r from the center belong to the sphere, like the surface of this ping pong ball. With a little bit of linear algebra, we can reformulate this into a more convenient form that will become in handy later. So now we want to check if the ray hits the sphere. For this we can simply insert the ray equation into the sphere equation and check for different values of t if this equation becomes true. Of course, a better solution would be to try to solve this equation, which, which is not so difficult, and I show you the necessary steps to go from the original equation into an easier form, which is a quadratic equation in t. And this is very convenient because there, there is a very well-known known formula for solving quadratic equations. In ray tracing, this has a very convenient geometrical interpretation. If there's no solution, the ray simply misses the sphere. If there's one solution, the ray is just tangent to the sphere. And if it has two solutions, one is where the ray enters the sphere and one is where it exits. Okay, it's that simple. We have everything we need for our first ray tracing algorithm. I wrote some code and I programmed the pen plotter to plot it out for us. So this is nice and all, but there are really just three circles on a blank background here. So where are the spheres? I mean the spheres are there, but you can't see the shape because there's no light. Typically you have two types of light, point light and directional light. Point light typically comes from light bulbs, um, which emit all the light from one single point. And directional light is typically something like sunlight or the light rays are parallel. So and there's a third type of light, ambient light. As you can see, the face is not, not facing the point light and the directional light still has some emulation. It's not pitch black. This is because the light is reflecting all over the room here and some of the light rays are hitting the face from this side. And we don't really want to model all of these reflections. 
we simply want to add a constant value to all the surfaces in the space just to add this feeling of ambient light. So for the ray tracing algorithm that means that we not only return the color of the object but the color of the object multiplied by, a, by an illumination value. And this illumination value is constant for ambient light and is dependent on the orientation of the object surface with respect to the light source for directional and point light. We want to have a function that returns a fraction of the illumination of the light depending on the angle of the surface relative to the light source. So intuitively, the light must spread over a larger area if it's coming from a shallow angle than if it's coming from a steep angle. As a geometric analogy, we can use a column of light where the width of the column is the intensity of the light. If the angle gets shallow, the area that the light spreads over gets larger, so the intensity of the light reflected back to the scene is lower. We want to find a function that returns the fraction of light intensity i given the vector l and the surface normal n. So how do we determine the length of a? Let's consider the right angle triangle PQQR with angles alpha, beta and 90 degrees. This side here has a length of i over 2 and this side PR measures a half. So how do we determine alpha? We know that the cosine of alpha is defined as the ratio of the adjacent side divided by the hypotenuse. The cosine of alpha is exactly the function that we are looking for that associates a fraction of i with the angle alpha. So note that PR and N also form a right angle triangle, also with the angles alpha and beta in 90 degrees. So we know that this angle is alpha 2. And we can determine the angle alpha between the two using some linear algebra. Doing this for all point and directional lights, we get the, this illumination equation for point P, which simply takes the ambient illumination and adds to this the directional components of all the points and directional lights for point P. So this model of light is called diffuse reflection and works great for matte objects. Matte objects generally have a rough surface and incoming light reflects in all directions evenly. So the color of the object only depends of its orientation to the light and not of its orientation to the camera or your eye. So shiny objects instead change its color if you move around them. And this is due because shiny objects primarily reflect light in one direction and less in other directions. So to calculate the spectral reflection, we need to first calculate the vector of the reflected light. Second, we need to calculate the angle between the reflected light and our point of view. And then third, we need to come up with a function that associates a fraction of the light intensity with this angle. So one and two are pretty straightforward. So let's focus on the last one. So instead of using a physical model, we can use a heuristic that has been proven to give good results in practice. We know that cosine alpha can be calculated using the dot product of the vectors and the norm of the vectors. As we have seen, the cosine is a function that returns one for zero degrees of deviation between the light and the viewport and returns zero if the viewport is angled at plus or minus 90 degrees relative to the light with continuous values in between and we ignore the negative side of the cosine function. The light reflected is brightest if the camera looks directly in the reflection and gets gradually more dim. To add some variety to the surface, we can change the cosine function to make it slope more aggressively. For example, by raising it to a power. We simply add the specular reflection term to the illumination equation. Now we can take a look how it looks rendered.
where there is light, there is shadow. So let's add this to the algorithm. We can simply add a rule that says if there's an object between the light source and the surface of the object we want to evaluate, we don't add the light to the object's illumination. So, but how do we find if there's an object between the point we want to evaluate and the light source? Well, we can simply use the ray tracing algorithm that we have used before. We just now move the point of the ray origin to the point P on the object surface and draw a ray in the, in the direction of the light. And on calculating the illumination value for this point, if there's intersection on the ray, we don't add the light's illumination. There's some details here worth mentioning that we need to change on the ray tracing algorithm to get the desired effect. So first, we don't want points behind P to cast shadows on P, obviously. So T must be bigger than zero. So in for point lights, we only want objects between the light source and the object surface to cast shadows on the object surface. So we only need to check values for t between 0 and 1. And finally, t of 0 would always be a solution because the ray starts at p, which is part of an object. So we start the ray not at p, but slightly above p, so t values that are slightly above 0. Here added a false sphere to act like a ground to cast the shadows on. So this looks pretty good already and I'm quite happy with it, but there's one thing we can add which is pretty amazing in ray tracing, which are reflections. And uh, this is due to the fact that we're using a physical model to model the reflections. If a ray hits a mirror, it's not reflecting the color of the mirror, but whatever the reflected ray hits. So we can use a similar idea as with the shadow. We can use the ray tracing function here again to check the reflected rays. In fact, we can use the very same function that we just used to detect the reflected surface recursively and now just move the start point of the ray from the origin of the camera to the point P on the surface of the object and the direction of the ray is just the direction of the reflected light. So if you create a recursive function, you need an exit condition. So one natural exit condition is if the ray doesn't hit the reflective surface anymore. And this often happens after one reflection or so, the ray bounces off to infinity and doesn't hit anything. But it still can happen that a ray bounces between two parallel walls and never stops. So for this reason, we define a maximum recursive depth. Usually we use two or three because after that the images get very distorted and the effect is really not worth the computational effort to put in. So most reflective surfaces aren't mirrors. So they show their own color along with the reflective color. So we can use a value between zero and one to choose how much of the reflective color is shown compared to the object's color. So I'm really amazed how good the images look compared to how simple these concepts really are. I mean they are computationally demanding or can be, especially in real time. And it's very ridiculous to plot them out using a pen plotter. But uh, still, I mean, I find it fascinating that you, you can use these computer graphic concepts also to generate paintings or real images. And how many effects you can get with just a single concept. So huge shout out to Gabriel Gambetta, who spoke computer graphics from scratch, hugely inspired this video. And I'll link his uh, book down in the description. There's a free online version available with his code in JavaScript. And I think the complete book is available there. There's also a paper version to buy if you want that. Uh, I can highly recommend if you're interested in ray tracing and want to learn more about the concept that I explained here, um, make sure to check it out. Um, yeah, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. I'll leave you with this.